Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da. Habitif Allah continue on in our study of the creed. We mentioned some of the ayat and some of the ahadith which illustrate for us the importance of following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that that is what we are ordered to do as believers. And from those ahadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The best of you is those of my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. So the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een were the best of this ummah. Then those who followed them, meaning the tabi'een. Then those who followed them, meaning the itba'a tabi'een. <clears throat> then after them, those people who come after from the ulama, those who follow that sunnah, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the sabila salaf salih and the way of the pious prede predecessors. And with in regards to this, we see that the Ummah has broken into sects, and we've mentioned this countless times, and I think there's no mystery, as we see what's going on in places like Syria, and in Iraq, and all over the Muslim world, that there is a, there is conflict between Sunni and Shia, for example, and amongst the other sects, and, and groups, and as we mentioned before, distinguishing between groups like Ikhwan al-Muslimin and Jamaat al uh, and other groups and then there are sects, sects like Shia, the various sects of Shia, Shiism as well as uh, the various Sufi tariqa or Turuq as well as the other groups and, and sects and in this regard the Prophet ﷺ gave us a prescription he said that in a hadith, he said, kathira, that you will see many differences. So those who live after the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, which of course is us, and those after the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, would see many differences. That means there would be much splitting and many differences of opinions and many difference of uh, 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 groups and ahzab. And the Prophet ﷺ said, prescribed for us, that the way, the ilaj for this sickness, for this splitting, because the splitting would take place, it is perhaps a natural, unfortunate human condition that we split and that we call to our, uh, we have nationalistic cause, we have racist cause, we have all these things which distinguish us as people. However, we revert to the negative hizbiyah when it comes to this, thinking that you're better and your group is superior to another group because of race, because of tribe, because of nationalism, because of uh, the various other reasons we split, because of political party even. And this hizbiyah is a dangerous threat to humankind because this is what causes the disruption and this is what causes people to split to such an extent to where they demand the blood of others and cause bloodshed so the ummah of muhammad sallallahu wa sallam was not immune to this and in fact we have so much so many groups and sects and this is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if tarakatil yahuda la itta wa sab'in firqa the Prophet ﷺ said the Jews will break into 71 sects, the Christians into 72 sects, my ummah into 73 sects. All of them in the fire except one. They said, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? He said, the, they are those who follow my sunnah and the way of uh, my companions. Letting us know that the way to save ourselves and to deal with this hezbiyah, to deal with this, dis this disruption 
and this bida that divides us and the sectarianism is by going back to what the Quran and the Sunnah says and to the Sabil of Mu'mineen and what the Sahaba what they were upon and then after them those who followed them in righteousness so that is our prescription because the Prophet ﷺ said in the other hadith that we were mentioning, if فَسَيْرَا اِخْتَلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةُ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَحْدِينَ عَذُوا عَلَيْهَا بِيْنَ وَاجِذْ وَإِيَّاكَ وَمُحْتَثَانَ الْأَمُورَ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ دِنَةٍ ضَلَالًا The Prophet ﷺ said, you will see many differences. فَسَيْرَا اِخْتَلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ but it's upon you, my sunnah. وَسُنَّةُ Meaning Abu Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman wa Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in and those who follow them. فَعَلَيْكَ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةُ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَحْدِينَ أَذُوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدِ And bite, cling to them with your molar teeth. Cling to this sunnah with your molar teeth because there's so many challenges. As we see, we see the relevance of this hadith. There are so many ideologies. There are so many different ways of thinking. We live now... 1400 years later, look at how much technology, how many ideologies have come just in the past 100 years. The past 100 years, more than the whole other 1300 years has happened in this past century. And in the past 20 years, past 30 years with tech technological advancements and developments in the internet and ideas being, uh, you know, transferred around the world, so much has changed and so much has happened. And there are so many assaults to Islam and the ways of the past, traditional ways. And with that being said, that means for us as believers, we have to have the tools to defend ourselves against those ideologies. As Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, al-ilm hu silah, that knowledge is like a sword using that to slash away the shabahat and the shahu, you know, the, the doubts, those various ideologies, those hizbi ideas and groups and sects and, the, and what they bring. Because it wouldn't be a challenge if it didn't have some appeal. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to make this relevant for us. Look at some of our dua that we have in America, especially some of those who are really out there leading. I'm not talking about Salafi du'a. And some of them who were at one time were perhaps Salafi or associated with the Dawah to Ahl Sunnah. But they changed to such an extent because of the environment and because of the assault in the envi various environments they immersed themselves with, they didn't have the tools to equip themselves and the doubt came to them. The Shubahat. And it comes to all of us. But it's how we deal with it. And it's how we go back. Do we go back to try to correct and amend and defend ourselves by going back to the Qutb al-Ilm and the Qutb al Salaf specifically? Because it's very appealing to say, hey, that was 1,400 years ago. We need to have a new, a new type of fiqh, meaning a new understanding of how we practice such and such and such and such. And we need a new political ideology because perhaps it has, we can adapt something from the Qur'an or the, the, the explain something from the Quran to kind of to fit this this new this new political ideology, for example, democracy or whatever the case may be. All of these shubahat they come and they're enticing. But what is going to defend you? It's upon you the my sunnah, meaning the sunnah of the Prophet. And the Sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin al mahdiin And going back to the example of the du'a that I was mentioning, uh, uh, that I was mentioning. So some of these guys have changed so much from the time in which they originally studied, that from their study, and it can happen. I fear this, and we should all fear this, because your environment. Right now, I live in a protected environment. I'm in Saudi Arabia. I have my books around me. I have the ulama are here. I can, you know, I, many ulama here. I can, you know, I can protect myself and I can live in an uh, Islamic environment, in, a, in an environment with tawheed 
uh, entrenched in the society. But when I go back to America, which uh, I will do, and if I end up in another country, Canada, for example, or wherever the case may be, you're going to have to deal with other ideologies that are accepted as the norm. And you're going to need the tools of Elm to deal with those things. And you're going to need to go back to that hustle to defend yourself because those ideas are going to be enticing. Those new forms of Tao are going to be corrupting and enticing. If you don't go back to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the understanding of the Salaf Salih. And even with that, people can make their own with the claim of that, but they can deviate with that same claim. Claiming that they're following the Sabil of Mu'mineen, the Sabil of Salaf Salih, but in fact, what they're doing is, is contrary to that, that path. Ayyul Habba. Going back to what the Shaykh said. He then mentioned in his text the definition of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. He said the linguistic meaning of a Sunnah. He said the word a Sunnah is derived from Sana Yusunnu Yusunna, uh, which it means. When we say Sunnah al Amr, it means he explained the matter. A Sunnah means, as far as the relevance for us, it means uh, the, a path, a way. So when we talk about the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, we're talking about the way of the Prophet. وسلم, and we're talking more specifically. Because as we mentioned, I believe we mentioned this in the prior sitting, uh, a sunnah, how the ulama of the past, the time of the salaf, our salaf, they described a sunnah being, meaning uh, all of Islam. They didn't distinguish. The sunnah did not mean, as we use it generally, as a fiqh, with the, uh, the tarif of the contemporary fiqh scholars, to describe, uh, you know, something being mustahab or something being uh, recommended as an act of recommended. Like, so did you pray your sunnahs? Okay, I prayed my rakatain of maghrib. Uh, af after salat al-maghrib, I prayed the rakatain, the sunnah. Sunnah prayers. The extra. And we use it like that. But sunnah, with the classical scholars especially when it re related to all of Islam and even more specifically to Ittiqad, to Aqidah. So we use it very differently than the way the Salaf used it. And that's why you have books like a sunnah lil Khalal or uh, a sharia li ala laqai or, uh, or li uh, ala juri. And you have, uh, you know, uh, Kitab al Tawheed by uh, Ibn Khuzayma. And all of these classical scholars, the way the terms were used in, uh, a sunnah referred to all of Islam. And even the concept of Tawheed was re referenced to all things related to Iman. Of course, first and foremost being monotheism. But relating to Iman and, and the books that they wrote, Al Iman. Uh, all of these classical texts, the way they viewed the sunnah, again, it referred to Ittaqad, to creed. And it referred to all of Islam. And there are many examples of this in those classical texts. He says, a sunnah means a way or path either praiseworthy or reproachable. So, of course, we could say if you follow the sunnah of the shaitan, this is a deviant path. This is something which is repro reproachable. Something which is, 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 is not commendable. Something that is evil. And the Prophet ﷺ let us know in an authentic hadith about the sunnah of the, the people who came before us. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Tabiuna Sunnah and Kana Kablakum Hudwa al Kudva Tibul Kudva. Hatalo Dukalu Juhra Dub, La Dukul Tamuhu. Kalu Ya Rasulullah Al Yahud wa Nasara Kala Femen. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is in a hadith of uh, I, I I believe it's uh, Bukhari Muslim or it is in, let's see if he has the 
or maybe uh, just Muslim. Uh, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, you would follow the way of those who came before you, hand span by hand span, and arm span by arm span, until they entered the hole of a lizard, you would enter it. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een that were with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, is it the Jews and the Christians? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered and said, Who else? And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You would follow them until they entered the hole of a, a lizard, to the hole of a bub. And we mentioned prior to this about the hole of a bub that it is a very windy, cavernous uh, hole like cave <coughs> and it's it's somewhat popular here amongst the Bedouins and the region I live in now in the eastern province you have it's more common I have met some students and their fathers and grandfathers definitely who who eat bub still they go hunting bub they show me pictures and videos uh, they promised to bring one so I could see it alive or dead and the bub, some of them are very long and big. But the point being, the Prophet made this example because the bub has a very tricky hole. And the way they hunt the bub here is that a lot of times they flush the bub out either with water, because the water, of course, traverses the easiest path and it will go into those, those caverns and flood the thing, so the, the hole, so the bub will come out and then they catch him. Or they will use the exhaust of their truck and they'll pump the exhaust into the hole of the bub and the bub will pop his head out and they catch him and you know prepare him to to uh, to partake to eat the point being that this is a tricky path meaning that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, would follow the way of the people before us or follow the other nations even if they went into the hole of the lizard, we would manage to do it. We would do it. Because we're following. And we follow in shirk, as is mentioned in the hadith of Abi, uh, Abi Waqaf, I think, um, or Waqas, the hadith in which he mentioned that the prophets, they were new to Islam. And that <clears throat> they were on a military, I think they were in the Battle of Tabuk, perhaps, a military campa campaign. And they came behind some trees, which the Mushrikeen referred to as Vatil and Wat. You know, it was one of their, their gods that they used for seeking blessings, especially in war. So they would hang their weapons on there. So, uh, Abu, Wa Abu Waqas al-Laythi, I believe, radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Ya Rasulullah, aj'al lana that al-anwat kama lahum that al-anwat. Oh, Ya Rasulullah, make for us that al-anwat. Make for us one like they have one. Because they felt that they needed this. They were going to seek barakah. This was a type of shirk. Of course, to seek blessings from trees. If I say, oh, I need to, I want more children, I want more wives, I want this, I want that, I want increase in my wealth, and I put my trust, or I uh, seek barakah from something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a type of shirk. The Prophet sallallahu answered, he said, subhanAllah, glory be to Allah. What we find from this hadith, and then to the rest of the hadith, is it shows us that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, would follow the way of other groups even if they committed shirk. And how many lands do we have people worshipping graves and saying La ilaha illallah? How many Muslims, especially for those living in the West who know they live in the UK, UK is a big movement, uh, in America too, big secular Muslim movements, 
that say we don't want Sharia. They don't. So they don't even know what Sharia is. For them, it's just a series of punishments. They don't know all of Islam is the Sharia. So they uh, renounce the Sharia to that extent, to where they say, no, we don't want. We just want to live how everyone else lives and practice however we want and just call ourselves Muslims. It's a part of my culture. How many women they follow? They just abandon the hijab without really much of a cause, and they believe that they are good Muslims. Although they are openly sinning, they've abandoned. I'm not talking about the issue of niqab or something like this. I'm talking about women not even covering their hair even. Or they simply just cover their hair and they wear whatever they want, a conservative dress, perhaps, a conservative miniskirt, perhaps, a conservative, you know, whatever. We follow the way of those who came before us. In everything, in manners and habits, we are losing our youth. If we look to what's going on in, in, in the West especially, all those people who made hijra, they're losing their, their youth. And maybe their first generation were okay, but how many uh, Somali, Pakistani, Indian, other youth that we see that have come to those Western countries and the, their children are lost? And the parents are asking, why? What happened? I thought I was giving... Uh, Muhammad a better uh, education. I thought Faisal was going to do better. I thought Fatima was going to be, you know, I want her to be free and I want her to have this and I want her to have this, but Fatima has a boyfriend. Uh, Muhammad smokes weed, drinks, clubs, is the biggest thrower of the partiers. He throws the biggest parties in the, in the, in the city. And he wears a, a cross, not even knowing, but he still considers himself Muslim or still says I'm Muslim. Or they just abandon their religion outright. This is the way we follow those who came before us and the danger of it. This is the point. This is the biggest danger. The Prophet ﷺ said, Men Whoever resembles a people, he is from them. So when we resemble others, in the way we act, in the way we dress, this is a way of showing uh, uh, an, an extra allegiance to their mentality and the way they think. And it's dangerous because the Muslim has an identity and the Muslim has a sunnah to follow. And that's the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We want to bring that to them. We want to invite them. We don't want to be invited all the time. We want to invite and set the example. They should look at the Muslim as the coolest and as the best and as the example. They should want to be like us because we should be the best in manners. We should be the kindest. We should have the most mercy. And we should have the, as Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, Ahl sunnah arhaman nas li khalq. They are the most merciful. Ahl sunnah is the most merciful to the people. They're the most merciful because they use the scales of the Sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we already mentioned the other hadith, "Min yaish min kum baadi fi sayra khilaf in kathira." And those who live uh, beyond me, after me, will witness many disagreements. We, how many disagreements? We have disagreements, unfortunately, sometimes between ulama of Ahl Sunnah, and it leaves our youth and the people confused about what position to take. This one made to of this one. This one, he made a couple mistakes in Minhaj. I've abandoned him. Why are you still sitting with him? Why have you invited him to the conference? Why have you... Look at this. This is Bain Ahl Sunnah. That's between Ahl Sunnah. What about all the differences outside of Ahl Sunnah within Islam? What about all the differences outside of Islam? We're assaulted by differences. So we have to have a, some clear way to deal with that. And that's going back to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa tasimu wa hablillahi jami'an wa la tafarqu and hold all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. Then the Shaykh mentioned about the linguistic meaning of al-jama'ah and it comes from uh, to congregate together to join together. So Ahl Sunnah are those people, the people of the Sunnah and group 
You know, they are grouping together. So they are calling the Muslims together. They're not calling the Muslims together on Batil, though. This is a difference. This is where we differ, where Ahl Sunnah differs with, for example, uh, Akhwan Muslimin as a group. Akhwan Muslimin, they're Muslims. They're from Ahl Bidah. They're a group, not a sect. And I think I talked about this prior to this. But they are a contemporary movement and group who looks to make political uh, alliances and to involve themselves in politi uh, politics in order to rectify their societies uh, and to eventually get to the goal of the Sharia or the goal of an Islamic State and other aspects of things that they try to do. But they're a political movement predominantly. So meaning all kind of other, all kind of Muslims go under their umbrella. And their biggest thing is is to bring about that unity. That's very important to them. But it's not the unity. They are willing to compromise Kitabi Law Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to achieve that unity. They are willing to accept other ways of protest and, and getting involved in this and this and such and such activity in order to get for them the means justifies the ends. So whatever means it takes to get to the end result, then that's fine with them. Ahl Sunnah, no. Ahl Sunnah sticks on that same minhaj, even if some of the people don't like it, even if people will, it, it, it becomes necessary to refute bid'ah and other ideologies. Ahl Sunnah stays on the straight path, and that's a narrow path. It's just the way of the Sunnah of the Prophet. And it's the Sabil al Mu'minin, and it's the way of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, that their their goal, they want to unite the believers, but they want the, uni the believers to unite upon the truth. And they cannot compromise that truth. Whereas other groups and sects, they want to unify as well, but they're they are willing to compromise the haq to get there. Al-Jama'ah, as we mentioned, the technical meaning of Al-Jama'ah is a group of believers and they are the predecessors of this ummah. They are the companions, their successors, the tabi'in, and those who follow them in goodness till the day of resurrection. Those who have been united upon the Quran and the Sunnah, they acted upon the right path of the Holy Prophet وسلم, manifestly and secretly. Allah Azza has ordered his believing slaves to be attached to the above mentioned group. And to, to, to unite, and we mentioned this. We mentioned this ayat already where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And hold all of you fast together to the rope of Allah, and do not divide. So Allah has ordered us what? There's two in this ayat. There's a command, and there's a prohibition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the ayat with the command in the imperative form, وَاَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Hold to the rope of the law. That's a command. Uh, and do not divide. That's a prohibition. Allah uh, ordered a command and he prohibited in that ayah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also commands Allah Subhanahu says, and be not as those who divided and differed amongst themselves after the clear proofs had come to them. It is they for whom there is an awful torment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, the, the hadith we already mentioned, and here's another uh, uh, mention of the hadith, in هَذِهِ الْمِلَّةِ سَتَرَفْ سَتَفْتَرِكُ عَلَى ثَلَاثَ وَسَبْعِينَ ثَنْتَانْ وَسَبْعِينَ وَسَبْعُونَ فِي النَّارِ وَوَاحِدَةٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَهِيَ الْجَمَعَةِ And that's the hadith we already mentioned where barely the nations of Muslims will be divided into 73 sects. 72 will go to the hell and one will go to paradise. This one will be a Jannah. So all of those other groups, their path as a group, as a a path as a minhaj that deviated is is to the path of hell and those who stick to the sunnah 
rightfully. Doesn't mean because you call yourself from Ahl Sunnah, or even that you are from Ahl Sunnah, but you, you know, we don't know what sins, you know, Allah knows our sins and knows our final destination. That all of this depends on you as an individual. But the path, the path is a Sabila Mu'mineen. It's the path of Ahl Sunnah Tiwil Jama'ah. That's what's going to save you. And those explainers of the hadith mention uh, some of the ulama, they mention that that this hadith, uh, those 72 that are in the fire, uh, mostly that they are from Ahl Islam. Because the Prophet said, said uh, He said, and from this ummah. So, meaning from this ummah, meaning that they are believers. But they would divide into 73 sects. So meaning that they're in the fold of Islam, but because of their bid'ah and because of their things they fell into, that they their path is the fire. Because they deviated from the correct path. The Prophet ﷺ gave us a path. Allah gave us this path to follow. It wasn't just a path, majarid sabil. You know, it wasn't just just to have a path and say, well, you could choose that path or choose another one, but you're all gonna get you're gonna get the same place. Left. Allah subhanahu wa taala gave us the hablillah. He gave us the rope of Allah, the book of Allah. And the sort of the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to adhere to, and so this is what the believers have to adhere to. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu explained, "Al jama'a ma wafak al haq when kuntu when kunta wahdak." This is a very very famous narration of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala who said the truth, uh, he said the group, the jama'ah means that which conforms to the truth though you may be alone. So meaning that a person can be on the haq and they might be alone so don't think that a jama'ah has to be uh, don't be impressed by the large numbers. A Khwana Muslimin is and jama'at tablik I think has the biggest adherence out of any Islamic group currently in the Ummah. As a group, you know, the adherents, they're in the millions. Likewise, the Quran Muslimin has a huge following around the world. But don't be impressed by the numbers. The numbers is not our salvation. Perhaps a person could be in a locality, one, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, whatever amount of people but they are on the truth. And all those around them could be on bid'ah and dalal. This can be the case. So don't be impre impressed by the huge numbers of those who oppose or deviate from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahl Sunnah Tibul Jama'ah, they are those people who, firm, who hold firmly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sunnah practically and are acting upon the sayings and deeds of his companions and their successors regarding Islamic monotheism who have been adhering to the obedience of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam firmly and constantly and keeping themselves away from innovations. These are the helped group, the saved sect, who would remain predominant at all periods in truth until the day of resurrection. So obedience to them and living with them is the right path, while to oppose them is deviance. So it's important to try to be with Ahl Sunnah. And this brings up uh, an issue of Hijra, that it is recommended and sometimes an obligation to make Hijra from one locality to another in order to be in a place where you can practice your religion better, in order to be in a place where you're safer to practice your faith, in order to be in a place where you're away from Bid'ah and you're closer to Sunnah. There's no place where it's perfect on the earth. However, you can improve your condition. Some places are stronger. There's many more adherence to Ahla Sunnah. There's more knowledge in that locality and you can benefit more. And you can be around Ahla Sunnah to be strengthened from your brothers and sisters who are on the same path, the path, the Sabila Mu'mineen. And in the next sitting, we'll talk about the attributes and distinctions of Ahlul Sunnah to a Jama'ah. We ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.